this kind of acceptance of death makes them outside the ability of Israeli power to enact itself. So the intensity of violence actually represents Israel losing control. It doesn't represent Israel actually maintaining. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. The Electronic Intifada. This is the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Nora Barrows Friedman. And I'm Asa Win Stanley. Welcome back to the Electronic Intifada podcast and welcome to our first episode of 2023. Today we're joined by Abdel Jawad Hamayel, a PhD student and lecturer in the Philosophy and Cultural Studies Department at Birzeit University in Palestine to talk about the current situation on the ground in the occupied West Bank. As our senior editor Maureen Murphy reported, in January alone, Israeli police, soldiers, and settlers killed at least 35 Palestinians, including seven children in the West Bank, as the violent repression in the territory that escalated throughout 2022 carried into the new year. Those deaths include 10 Palestinians who were fatally injured during a raid in Janine refugee camp, the single deadliest operation in the West Bank since at least 2005, according to a UN official. The uptick in fatalities followed a series of deadly attacks in Israel during March of 2022, several of them carried out by Palestinians from the Janine area of the northern West Bank, which has seen a resurgence in armed resistance against Israel's regime of apartheid occupation and settler colonization. Since then, the Janine area has endured almost almost daily raids, resulting in dozens of deaths. On January 26th, Israeli forces killed nine Palestinians during a raid in Janine refugee camp. A tenth Palestinian died from his injuries days later. Two children and a 61-year-old woman were among those killed in the Janine raid. 20 Palestinians were injured, four of them critically, according to the health ministry. Al-Haq, a Palestinian human rights group, said that the raid began with a siege on a home in the camp. Three occupants of the building were killed by Israeli shelling. The military also bulldozed part of a community organization in the camp and targeted electricity generators, cutting off power and internet in the area, including to the main hospital in Jenin, according to the rights group. Palestinians in Gaza fired rockets toward Israel following the deadly Janine raid, and Israel hit sites in Gaza that it claimed were used to manufacture rockets. That was from our Palestine in Pictures monthly report by our editor Maureen Murphy. We'll have the link to that in the blog post that accompanies this episode. Abu Hamayel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. We're really glad you're here too. Um, Can you talk about the last month in the West Bank in particular and what you've observed yourself in terms of the escalation in Israeli attacks and the current atmosphere on the ground? I think, I mean, the current situation is as follows, is that we, in the West Bank, there's a rise of new spaces of resistance, if you want to call them, like... um, they have made life harder for the Israeli military to enter and arrest and exercise the power of arrest, which has been going on for the past decade or so without much um, resistance. And um, these spaces have mostly been basically uh, uh, self-defense type of like, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary positioning. So they're not acting or enacting a lot of offensive operations they mostly handle the military when they enter these areas and this has created a situation where israel is just not having it so they're going in and, and exercising instead of the power of the arrest a power of of death of killing and and uh of creating this uh that what, what you rendered just previously Um, The intensity of death that is happening in the West Bank is a direct result of that. So this is what's happening at this point. I mean, we can talk about why these spaces rose and how they rose and what they tell us about economics, etc. But at least um, in terms of the tactical and military conversation, um, we're seeing basically um, self-defense zones defending themselves against an Israeli military that is attempting to kill them in 
Yeah, let's talk about um, why they've uh, reappeared in, in especially areas in the northern West Bank, uh, in Janine and in Nablus, where the, the lion's den is located and is um, defending the communities there. Um, you know, especially like in terms of the <laughs> the lack of real defense by the Palestinian Authority, which is, you know, supposed to be uh, in charge of defending Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, but as we all know, the Palestinian Authority has has remained basically a subcontractor of the Israeli occupation. Um, in the last week or so, we saw the PA announce that it would be um, pausing its so-called security coordination with Israel. You know, they, they've said that before. And of course, no pause was <laughs> happened. Um, can you talk about what what it you know really the the role of the Palestinian Authority and how that fits into the context of what we're seeing with uh the lion's den for example other resistance um factions really stepping in to provide uh civilian defense I mean it's a it's a long story but to make it short I mean I think the PA is central to all of this um the PA since 2006 because in the second intifada it was basically mostly destroyed as at least an institutional existence and was resurrected um, in an attempt to provide again um, the israelis with the power to expand in terms of territorial settlement expansion etc while the pa handles the people the palestinian people living in the west bank uh, specifically excluding jerusalem of course so in in this sense, what we had is this kind of dual wall where we have where you have a military occupation that enab enables settlement expansion and a PA, which deals with the people, civil uh, issues, security coordination, and other uh, realm. But the PA has almost sold always sold the Palestinians a very ideological stance that this current situation is only temporary, that it's working towards a realization of a state. And that its realization of the state is built on the strategy of legal internationalization or lawfare, that it's built on, um, you know, um, pressuring EU, the US to interfere in the conflict by proving um, their ability to maintain security on the ground. Um, the idea was that eventually um, the Europeans and Americans will come in and give us a state. And that never really. No, I mean, since 2012, the EU, the UN, a lot of international organizations declared Palestine ready to become a state, but the state never um, actually borne fruit. So you have the situation where its basic ideological premise that it sells to the people basically is crumbling. Therefore, we're seeing this kind of unbinding process, if you want, from the PA, even among Fatah caters who are uh, somewhat tied to the PA, at least present or represent the social base on which the PA relies to maintain its control, its social power in society. And particularly the, the north of the West Bank, beyond its long history of resistance to the, to the Israelis and the Zionist, colon, and Zionist colonization, I mean, it goes back before 48, beyond that memory of resistance that plays a role in its resurgence um, today, um, has not been really a central part of PA planning, economic development, um, institutional building. So you also have this kind of neglect that are also, um, you know, have a lot of social antagonisms about how the PA dealt with its, you know, placing Ramallah as a central place for its existence, uh, where all the ministries are, where most of its developmental aid goes to, um, and actually drawing a lot of people from uh, areas like Janine and Nablus to work into Ramallah, no? So actually the, the people who might serve as, let's say, um, an echo of PA ideology um, in the north of the West Bank are mostly living in Ramallah, uh, which means that uh, we can see the north of the West Bank as one of the areas where PA ideological power, social presence is the weakest. Um, and therefore it provides um, under the current uh, situation on the ground, the pretext for why a lot of these new movements are rising and, um, you know, holding um, arms, um, developing the self-defense strategy that I, I talked about. 
Uh, I mean, it goes also to the presence of other Palestinian militant groups like the Islamic Jihad, Hamas, um, people who are in Fatah but are unhappy about the current leadership or other parts of uh, Palestinian uh, political parties that are basically pushing for a new uh, configuration, a new presence on the ground, uh, one that is built, generally speaking, on a new generation of Palestinians, people from 18 to 35 who are willing to take up and who are presenting or representing this kind of new spirit of resistance in different ways. We can also talk about that later, but at least my reading is that the north of the West Bank um, seems a logical place for such a resistance in its current form as a self-defense zone. I mean, because remember, resistance does ex exist everywhere else, but it takes just different forms. Um, and But in the north of the West Bank, it's one of these places where uh, the social marginalization of these places, uh, the, un, the ideological unbinding from the PA, but also a hugely important point, which is the existence of a lot of refugee camps, old cities. And these are very narrow spaces or cramped spaces, if you want, um, which enable uh, the development of like a self-defense, um, civilians, armed, and uh, capable uh, of engagement, military engagement with the Israeli army. So, I mean, these cramped spaces are the the, the hot resistance right now right. because they present like a cover, you know, a social, but also an urban cover for, for these resistance fighters who are uh, attempting this kind of self-defense zone making in, in the north of the West Bank, yeah. Right. And, you know, consequently, uh, Israel is doing, I mean, um, the, the massacre that, that happened in Jenin just a, a few weeks ago, um, where, you know, Israeli uh, jets were, you know, dropping missiles on Jenin, um, which hasn't happened for, you know, more than a decade and a half. Um, the, 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 the reaction by, you know, the Israeli uh, apartheid government and also the PA um, has been uh, pretty vicious. And, um, you know, how how does, what happens uh, during a massacre like that? What is the intention of Israel? Um, and, and how is the resistance, you know, maintaining um, despite uh, all of these attacks against it? I mean, what, what enables resistance is this like, um, position that the resistance fighter is taking um, in in the Palestinian context right now. I mean, what we see with this new generation is this unwillingness to actually surrender or negotiate. I mean, it does happen sometimes, but mostly they're are, um, unafraid of death. They have this wager with death. They accept that they might die. They accept this probability. And that's what makes them very sub. And, and perhaps revolutionary, you know, like because this kind of acceptance of this makes them outside the ability of Israeli power to enact itself. So the intensity of violence actually represents Israel losing control. It doesn't represent Israel actually maintaining control. I mean, to retain control, it uses this, you know, um, Israeli power, air power, and discussions over how to uh, tactically kill these groups, uh, intelligence information on these groups, um, special forces and the use of it, um, whether there should be a large-scale military uh, military operation or whether they should just sustain this kind of like uh, pressure on these groups by uh, creating like, um, you know, and uh, special type of oper operations that they enter refugee camps or, or the old city in, in Nablus. Um, you know, um, targeting a specific, let's say, cell and then, then they leave um the israelis are attempting different mix of tactics but what is essential here is that for the first time at least in 16 years you have hundreds of palestinians if not more and a surrounding environment that accepts this wager with that and that's why that you know you you see um israelis acting the way they act and I think it also has reasons with Israeli mentality when it comes to like enacting military operations. They don't want to lose any soldier. Uh, they want to go in um, without having anybody killed. So they enact operations where they use heavy uh, fire 
have heavy firepower. Remember, most of uh, of these fighters didn't ever actually kill an Israeli, didn't ever actually commit um, operations that actually led um, to any Israeli death. But despite that, they're treated with this kind of heavy-handed military, um, uh, you know, uh, and security uh, mentality by the Israelis. Uh, this insistence in Israel on like protecting its soldiers um, means that when they enter in any area, they're willing to use firepower mostly indiscriminate, and it leads to these uh, to what happened a week ago or 10 days ago in Jenin of uh, 10 people being killed in one operation and a lot of other people being injured severely, etc. So this is the problem. This is the dynamic that is happening. And I think, you know, historically, Israel has lost um, some of its, let's say, um, you know, heroism, its capability of um, entering areas, land areas, there's an Israeli insecurity about this. You know, in Lebanon, they were defeated. In Gaza, it wasn't easy. Um, and therefore, this type of heavy-handed uh, approach policy uh, comes also from this long history of actually meeting resistance fighters in Lebanon, Gaza, and other places and and being defeated on the ground, at least. You know? So, I mean, this reliance on like firepower, on air power, is partially the result of this failure, of this historical failure. So they're using their technologies, um, their good intelligence, special operations, go in and out uh, without any injuries on their soldiers, and therefore they're willing to commit uh, whatever is necessary to do that as, right. a, as a military power. Yeah. Right. I mean, they thought that they had um, successfully quelled the resistance in the West Bank, um, you know, for the last you know, 16, 17 years. Um, can you talk about the, the this new generation of fighters that you mentioned um, and and how these factions are emerging um, with with, you know, relative success at this at this point? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how you can measure success because success always is like a very, let's say, instrumental, rationalist type of like uh, thinking, no? It comes to um, the rise of this new generation. I think, and this is actually an Israeli reading. The Israelis read this as this is a generational fight. We have a new generation of Palestinians. These guys are not scared to die. And we need to remind them of Israeli power. We need to remind them of what Israel could do. We need to uh, create yet another trauma. And 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 therefore, again, this goes back to our earlier question of why the use of you know um, firepower in the way Israel is is using it. I mean, this new generation of Palestinians that has not been a witness to the second intifada or the first intifada has not been truly arrested or gone through the motions of mourning or uh, gone through the motions of interrogations in Israeli prisons. Um, this new, fresh, if we want to say, generation of people that, you know, they that has this like will to power, will to engage the Israeli military, need to be reminded of Israel's power of Israel's military capabilities, of intelligence, of Israel's uh, ability to kill, to choose who to kill, to choose who not to kill. And therefore, you see this kind of like also enactment of trauma on the, you know, why Israelis are, you know, excessively using firepower and not only in Janina and Nablus, actually all over, you know, the West Bank, um, because they're reading it somewhat as a generational fight that they need to win. They need to make sure that this new generation of Palestinians also understand that they cannot be successful, that they cannot challenge Israel's power in the West Bank, that they cannot make a difference. And, and therefore, this excessive use of, of, of killing, arrest, etc. cetera. And, and I mean, if you look at the last year, the policy has been an expansion of arrests, even what is called in Israel, like, the, you know, a Attention was as a form of preventive arrest. It's attempting to kill any form of political leadership arising around this form of struggle by, you know, um, choosing people who they think might uh, provide, you know, the infrastructure for the rise of a new le leadership, a leadership that could prove an alternative to the current PA leadership and the class interest it represents. 
So at this moment, um, the Israeli strategy of containment and of maintaining pressure on these self-defense zones um, of these new spaces of resistance and attempting to close you know, the wall at the beginning of the year, make sure the security wall is actually a security wall, like that no Palestinian could enter into the, the heart of the settlement settlements in, in 1948. Um, this all, this whole policy that they 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 see it as something that is going to escalate, as something that is going to you know um, uh, roll on in the in the next couple of months, even years, and therefore they need to be ready, and 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 therefore they're kind of like you know um, trying to eat Palestinians for lunch before Palestinians eat them for dinner. I mean that's the the logic, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's going to work because they're also creating the space and the escalation in the conflict. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Abu Hamayel, um, part of part of this, like um, you know, uh, this this oh. escalation of violence is. Um, I mean, it's part and parcel of like what a settler colony does. Uh, you know, it deputizes its citizens to be um, to be part of the, you know, security uh, apparatus. We see this now just in the in the last week. Um, the Israeli government announced that it would be uh, expanding licenses for personal firearms for Israeli settlers. Um, you know, and this is, I, I, I actually was surprised. I didn't think there were many licenses to begin with or, or, you know, or restrictions on like yeah. how many firearms, uh, Israelis can carry, but what does this signify in terms of like national and political policy, um, with this new Israeli government and, and what could be the result of, of like the, the escalation of, of literal firearms, um, in the hands of Israeli settlers? It's actually um, ironic because in many cases where they expanded the existence of firepower, you saw Israelis killing Israelis. No, I mean, and mistaking, uh, you know, right. another. Israeli. You know, Israeli society is also like conflicted. It has different ethnicities and groups, and you know, a Yemenite Jew or a, you know, a Sephardic Jew is different than Ashkenazi, and and this creates a lot of different problems. And it happened actually repeatedly, where um, you know this fear of the rise of, let's say, another form of resistance in the past couple of years, which was based on what is called in like, let's say, military literature, like the lone wolf phenomenon. I mean, I think it's a it's a wrong description of this phenomenon. But what it's happening is that beyond these self-defense zones, and this is what happened after Janine, you saw operations happening in the heart of Jerusalem, no, in East Jerusalem, in the settlement of Nabi Yaakov and, and other places. So Israelis in their war in the north of the West Bank are getting also, you know, uh, attacks by Palestinians um, in the south of, you know, in the Negev, in the heart of Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in other places. And one of the most important elements of that is that they cannot actually predict that intelligence doesn't work here, no, because it's not an organized phenomenon. It's some nuts actually have, you know, predictive capacity or infiltrate a specific group or understand a specific, you know, organization and, and its network of operations. It's somebody who has the will to go and enact, you know, uh, an operation. And Israel just doesn't have a real response for that. So you see this kind of like, you know, spiraling of different policies where Israel is trying to maintain what it calls harta'a in Hebrew or um, or what is it called, you know, deterrence, you know. So, you know, if somebody attacks Israelis or settlements or settlers or, or soldiers, um, we're going to like kidnap his body. That's the first. Thing. We're gonna uh, make his family pay a price. You know, a very tribal approach as well. You know, um, you killed one of us, so we're gonna like make your family uh, hurt. It's also something that is under international law. You know, uh, rejected um, under any law actually is also right. uh, rejected. Yeah, it's collective punishment, right? Collective punishment, um, closing or destroying somebody's house. Now they're talking about maybe deporting people or um, doing other type of stuff, increasing the presence of what you just said, um, you know, uh, licenses for guns. 
So this kind of like uh, this kind of spiraling of policy of trying to maintain like some sort of deterrence, despite its failure historically, despite that it didn't really actually create the deterrence that they wanted to create, um, means they're in a very hard position. No? It means that they're you know they they don't really know what to do. They don't really know how to solve this problem. They don't really know how to solve this phenomenon. And 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 that shows a, a you know the weakness of the current uh, uh, Israeli mentality of dealing with the Palestinian issue only on a security military basis. So it's not a political issue; it's just a security issue. And and they can enact whatever security issue they want, but as we see over and over again throughout the history of Palestinian confrontation with Israeli uh, colonialism since the first. Zionist settler came in. Resistance has just a way of uh, coming back in different forms, in different generations, different Palestinians. And it has a way of, you know, um, of exploiting these type of weaknesses, um, even on the level of what we just said, this lone wolf phenomenon that, that it, and they have no real answer to. Finally, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, how uh, how you're seeing the situation kind of unfolding. I know it's it's impossible to predict or to speculate, um, but you know, based on uh, what we're seeing with, you know, as we mentioned, like the resurgence of these West Bank factions, with uh, Gaza continuing to be. Um, you know, a pretty strong force against Israeli colonization. Um, and with this new generation being willing to fight, um, how do you see the, the you know, oh, also, and and with the Palestinian Authority and the state that it is, um, you know, continuing to sell out, uh, continuing to work with Israel and the EU and the US and Canada, um, how do you see the situation um playing out as uh, you know as best as best you can predict at this point i mean i think this is the this is the problem of the the space that we are in historically it's it's one where you know you see resistance resurging but you don't see at least in current discourse around resistance and even among the resistance fighters themselves or among the wider society a sort of futurity like some we can actually build on political um where does this lead us? You know, um, uh, what is possible uh, politically um, to achieve? So this is one of the problems of, of of fighting in the current moment, and this is why I think it's also like um, one of these unique moments that people are fighting despite the fact that these large scale narrative of retaining Palestine or liberation or um, you know it's 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 you know these type of you know meta narratives have. You know, have lost their capacity and power uh, um, to ignite people's imagination. Remember that, you know, here is that one of the, you know, we can read resistance currently developing as a symptom of PA weakness, you know, on a social level, on an economic level, or on an ideological level. But it still retains a lot of its power as two things going on for it. Uh, the incapacity of Palestinians to think of an alternative to the PA. It's a, it's a very crippling. We just don't have an answer, a concrete answer of what to do if the PA doesn't um, exist anymore, um, specifically on an economic level, specifically because it, 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 it employs 32% of the Palestinian workforce. Um, and, and this type of economic power and incapacity to think of an alternative um, is quite crippling on a political level. What do you do without the PA? How would you organize society without the PA? I mean, this is one of the elements that makes this moment a moment where I think we're gonna see kind of resistance coexisting with another form of, you know, continuity in the in the in and you know horizon of a consumer society that has malls in Palestine, of you know, a day-to-day -day life that people are basically clinging on, 
a sense of like clinging to the PA because at least um, we can survive is really power. And you can see it, Nora, because I mean, even the PA discourse coming from its leaders, justifying security coordination at this moment um, is one where it says like, look, security coordination protects you from Israeli death, protects you from Israeli uh, power, protects you from Israeli uh, ability to go crazy, you know? Um, thing where what we can do is only cooperate with the enemy to main our to maintain our bare existence you know and this is something this is a, this is also a form of ideological power that maintains the peer you know but still there's a process of unbinding happening a process where people are rejecting that a process that we can see um um you know becoming material in terms of like the rise of resisting groups and 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 and, and their power so I see them kind of coexisting together. I see resistance and the day-to-day -day life moving on, at least for the moment. I don't see Intifada in the way we saw it um, historically in the first Intifada or even in the second Intifada. I see a reluctance among people to go uh, all in, you know, but I see also a willingness of, uh, of these that the return of this capacity to in, to act in the world, this capacity to resist, what 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 will it actually lead to? So I think this is the type of like you know uh, scenario that I see at least for the the next couple of months or uh, or the next year or so. I mean, but you know anything could happen. You know, predicting the future is always you know um, yeah, something. Yeah, you have to go with caution on that one. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Especially in Palestine, things can change in an instant. Yeah. 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 I mean, but it also doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, these flashes, you know, this yeah. spontaneous rise of like um, large scale rebellions. Um, but the problem is how do you sustain them? Um, that's a different question. They could rise, but they could also, you know, easily um, fade away. I mean, and I, I, I see that also reappearing but i don't see it necessarily being able to create itself in a very you know uniform way in a different rhythm but i think things has been since 2012 you know in 2012 there ha there was not a single operation or israeli killed or injured in a single operation coming from the west bank the whole year you know it was one of the quietest years in the history of the israeli occupation from the eyes of, let's say, Israeli intelligence and Israeli military and Israeli security establishment. And since 2012, we have this slow but intensifying resurgence of uh, of resistance in different forms, um, you know, in terms of demonstrations, large-scale rebellions in Jerusalem, uh, within even 1948, uh, uh, among 1948 Palestinians, and also in the West Bank, taking these varied forms, the West Bank or in other areas um, throughout. So this intensity, this intensification is is happening, and it's rapidly increasing. The PA is losing power every day. It's infighting is also making it even weaker. Um, but still, I still think that the PA is more powerful than people give it. You know, um, give it credence. Um, it has this economic power, it has this binding power to it, and it has this capacity um, to a, to make us not think of an alternative to it. So this is this is one of the problems that we have on at least on a political level. Um, how can we fill you know our imagination? What could we do politically? What is possible? There's still something that nobody can really answer. I think that's a, a good place to leave it. Abdel Jawad Hamayel, uh, you are a PhD student and a lecturer at Birzeit University in the West Bank in Palestine. Uh, we'd love to have you on again. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you again. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net 
and clicking on donate now. Thank you.